Hello, my name is Julie Hall, and I want to welcome you here today, and thank you for joining us. I also want to thank Norton Media for supporting us in this effort. What we are trying to accomplish here is to give the folks that maybe haven't met military people, aren't accustomed to military people, an opportunity to see inside and what we think and you know what they think and some of the experiences they have. So with me today, I have John Danahy. Did I get that right, John? You sure did. Okay, You're great. one of the few. Oh, well, good. So I, I'm glad. Uh, so we're going to talk to John today, and we're going to ask John to tell us a little bit about himself, if you would. Okay. Um, or a lot about yourself, <laughs> if you'd like. That's well, good, too. Well, I, I think that we'll try to keep most of it brief, but if you let me be too brief, then we might not get <laughs> everything we need here. But um, So, yeah, I, uh, right now in the civilian world, I'm, I'm retired so uh, from, from the military. Um, but I'm a business owner in Taunton, and uh, uh, I am, uh, I'm growing a business. We just crossed, uh, we're in our 13th month now. Very so, nice. Um, when I came back from my deployment, um, I was able to uh, work for a really great company up in uh, Bedford, Massachusetts called MITRE Corporation. I know MITRE. And uh, I spent uh, about 11 years there, and uh, I can't say enough good things about what they do, and I can't probably talk about a lot of the things that what they, do. they do, so uh, we'll just leave it at that, but a um, uh, very important and very critical role for the government, and I think that uh, uh, that was that was like probably uh, the, the uh, what would you call it, the capstone, I suppose, of, 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 so, of my career so far in IT. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's, that's I, I, I was spending three hours a day in the car and I just had a baby girl. Um, well, congratulations. Thank you, thank yeah. you. She's, uh, she'll be turning two next month. Wow. And uh, so, so that was really the decision point. You know, I was, sure. I, was, uh, I was making really good money, working for a really good company, but uh, that, that lifestyle on the road was just, uh, it was chewing me up. Absolutely, I know that So works. that's kind of how I got here. I don't want to talk too much about uh, school and stuff like that. I, I don't know. If that's something well I looked at you know and I you know got a little bit of your resume and yeah. you're <laughs> definitely uh, went through you went to Massasoit I did go I started uh, college at Massasoit because I wasn't school. really sure yeah. that I knew what I wanted to be when I grew up uh, so but I knew I wanted to get a four-year degree and quite frankly if it wasn't for the military uh, and the military experience with the National Guard I probably wouldn't have had the uh, self-discipline at that point in my life to actually do the right things for myself and, and move things along. So um, I'm, I'm one of those younger folks. Uh, I was I was pretty smart and I was pretty bored so mm -hmm. that led to a lot of interesting uh, <laughs> things I when I was it. younger. So um, so yeah it, it was a fantastic experience. Started out at Massasoit, went to U uh, Southeastern Mass University, went back to UMass Dartmouth for a master's mm -hmm. And uh, I'm pursuing a master's in systems engineering with WPI right now. Great. Um, so that's you know the education and the military side of the fence. I, I went through all of the leadership programs for the enlisted soldiers um, that that were offered. Basically, um, kind of an overachiever in that regard. Sure. But one of the, and one of the things that if you might and me interject here is a lot of people that don't understand you know and it really is the military is a culture of of education. They want you to be educated both as a leader and you know, in, in formal education. So I think you're a perfect example of that and something that I think for the civilian sector, something that they don't realize is that right. we're probably, and I you know, don't wanna say more educated, but we are, are kind of urged to become extremely educated yes. both in our profession and um, from a formal standpoint, so. Yes, and, and to add to that, I think that um, there's, there's there's a, a unique perspective for uh, growth in career and education in the military because there, there, you touched on it, but, but we haven't really called it out directly, which is there's that leadership component. When you get to be a leader, uh, you need to not only be a, you need to be a competent leader, but you also have to be a, comp, a competent um, you know, operator in the field in which you're specializing. So I, I think that um, regardless of whether you're an officer or enlisted, I think that there's a, there's a built into the system is that, uh, that mechanism that prevents people from staying there for extended periods of time that aren't advancing their career, right. that aren't advancing themselves educationally. So um, I, I can't even tell you the number of times as, as a 
first sergeant and as a senior NCO, uh, I brushed up against, you know, people who just, uh, for whatever reason, were either intimidated by education or didn't have that desire to get to the next level. Um, they, they found themselves either constrained or, um, you know, they, they needed to move on. And uh, so, so there was a, there's, there's been this growing um, change in the way that people are retained in the military as well. So it, it mirrors a lot more of what's going on in the civilian world than most yeah. people would, would recognize. Um, so yeah, it's, it's you either grow and, and right. achieve. Or and you go. The, <laughs> grow and go. <laughs> you're right, exactly. Grow so and go. There, there's a couple of ranks. You know, there's a rank in the enlisted area and there's a rank in the officer mm -hmm. er, arena that if you don't get past those in your career, you probably don't stay. Right. And um, that's by design. So um, a lot of people don't understand that that that, that structure uh, is really required for something that kind of scale, right? So what, what are we talking about with the Army, like a million soldiers, force squad? Right. How do you manage uh, a business of a million people? Right, exactly. Right. So and, and getting everybody to, to, and I think that's something, another thing that the military, and you could probably speak to this better, how do you get a million, you know, thousands of soldiers to move in the same direction, at the same time, in the same way? So t if you could talk to that a little bit. I could talk to it a lot, but yeah. <laughs> I won't. Uh, so, so I think that at the highest level uh, in what I've learned in my career, so I've been retired now for 10 years, happily I might add, but um, the, uh, my, my best recollection is, you know, there's that concept of commander's intent and that drives the bus, right? What are we trying to accomplish? Um, and, and that, you know, from a mission perspective, uh, or f from an operations perspective, those are absolutely critical, right? So that that engagement, that that activity, uh, you know what the outcome should be before it's engaged, right? So everyone is thinking about the same objective. They may not be thinking of it from the same perspective, but they know where the target is, and that is is so much different than the civilian world, right? Because so often we try to, you know, if we're just a civilian. We have to kind of figure out what we're what we're trying to accomplish for ourselves, and that gets to be kind of confusing. It's like a maze, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, but with the military, I think there, it's it's a little bit easier to understand what the next step is because there's so much documentation. The the system is well defined. Right. Um, so in the enlisted ranks, for instance, right? If I if I wanted to, which I did, you know, I wanted to progress through the ranks. I knew what those milestones were, I knew what the requirements were, I knew what competencies I needed to demonstrate, and as I accomplished those, and in a good rating and, and uh, a well-managed system for leadership, you know, those, those things that are important are not only reinforced, but recognized, right? So mm -hmm. they're, they're recognized, they're documented, they're assessed, uh, and they're recognized and rewarded. They're recognized either, you know, through, through remedial training or through rewards, right? So people get medals and things of that nature when they exceed what expectations are. Yeah, and I used to tell people, it's like, it's, you get an A on the test. You already know what the test is. Now it's just for you to fail right. or to meet that. So, you know, I think you're, you, the way you explain that is very well. It's not, you know, some people think it's very difficult to be. It's not difficult, it's a choice. It's always that inner choice you know what the rules are, right. you know. So, I right. mean, you don't have to worry about what you're going to wear in the morning. You don't have to worry about what you're going to eat. You don't have to. There's a lot of things that are not to worry about, and part of that is so you can focus 100% on the mission. E exactly. And 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 really, I mean, and and in that structure, there are different. You know, so there's different levels of worry, right? So. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of people worrying about a lot of different things, but it isn't one person worrying about everything, right? right. It's, it is, um, well, I guess it, when you're the commander, uh, that might be a different perspective, but as, as far as the enlisted folks go, you know what your job is, you understand what we're trying to accomplish, and you know your sphere of influence or, or what you are responsible and accountable for, and, and if you've got good leadership, they will hold you accountable, and that will help you grow and achieve. Right. So, um, yeah, so that's, that's kind of my experience in a little bit of a nutshell. Good. Did you, um, have you had any deployments? I did. I, uh, um, so, so I was uh, fortunate enough to be selected uh, to be the first sergeant for a uh, field artillery uh, target acquisition battery in Rehoboth, Massachusetts. Um, what I didn't know when I took the assignment on April Fool's Day, uh, 2002, 
uh, would be that uh, you know my life would change forever at that point. Uh, so my my strong advice to anybody who will ever watch this in the future: don't take a job on April first. Um, <laughs> But um, I say that jokingly because it uh, was, it really was the capstone of my military career. And um, I'd like to think in, in a lot of ways, uh, I helped a lot of people in that situation as well because I took my job very seriously. And I understood what the risks were associated with not taking my job seriously. Whether I was here or abroad, the, uh, requirement for the unit was significant. The army, uh, you know, uh, the army-wide, there, there's a significant lack of that specialization, both from the skills and the equipment perspective. So I kind of look at it like I was. I'm kind of honored that I was selected to be that first sergeant, knowing that uh, maybe some of these commanders that that thought that I should be that person uh, knew what was coming. Um, so. So they had kind of, you know, coached me into a career path change. I was a brigade level uh, communications NCO. I was a 31 Zulu, I think it was. I was a brigade level commo guy. I had uh, full control over, you know, the, the communication mission and making sure that it was working for a brigade level headquarters. And um, I basically capped out in that career path. Mm -hmm. um, so my sergeant major and my first sergeant approached me one day and asked me, if I'd be interested in reclassifying, they explain the situation to me like, this is as far as you're ever going to go. Uh, you'll never get to be first sergeant because there are no units that would support your specialty right. Right. from an MTO standpoint. Um, and MTO really, it stands for the Military Table of Organization and Equipment. Right. Um, that dictates the structure of the organization as it pertains to the primary war mission and all of the training and specialization that's required for those units, so. Um, yeah, I, th I think that's one thing people don't realize either, that there's a great thought process to exactly how many of these they need, how many of these they need, how many, you know, how many tanks, how many, depending on the mission, and they and they forecast it out. It's just, a, it's an amazing organization that you could, that you could never really express, and I think, you know, one of the things I wanna comment on and, and thank you for is a lot of people don't understand the everyday kind of things that go on with people and personnel and, and training and so forth. You know, they want to hear, hey, did you shoot somebody? You know, and it's not all about that. It's the everyday things that people do. Exactly. And, you know, the, the good news is that there's, you know, it, so the training program, as you're aware, has always been, uh, you know, task condition standard. So you know, there, there's, you know, in everything that we do, uh, the outcome is, is pretty well defined. How you get there, I think there's a lot of latitude, especially the more leader, you know, the higher in the leadership ranks that you, uh, that you achieve, the more latitude you have in mission accomplishment. Um, and, and that, I think, was, you know, that was another really rewarding mm -hmm. part of my career was, you know, it, we got to a point where it was like, okay, well, maybe sometimes the book doesn't work in this situation. <laughs> We've got to figure it out. And, and I think that in a lot of ways, the National Guard, um, uh, sets a standard that the Army can't achieve because we have folks from so many different backgrounds. When we deploy like that, I had electricians, I had plumbers, I had carpenters, I had uh, engineers, I had people who came from uh, many different uh, walks of life and, and we brought all of that skill and all of that experience to bear on a mission um, which was incredible. I mean, where, where we didn't have or where the system didn't provide we were able to adapt to this situation and make it right. uh, successful for ourselves. So how did you feel? And that's a little bit different. I was active duty, so we saw it every day, every day. And, but you just had, you know, a situation where you have folks that are thinking about, you know, hey, they could be working at Walmart, they could be working, you know, as carpenters, contractors, electricians. How did you feel that those people, were they able to transition pretty quickly into the mission? Because of the status with the National Guard, um, so the National Guard for a long time really did get uh, a bad reputation and, and in a lot of ways I think that that was well deserved. Uh, in the early years of my career I could see how that would happen um, but you know uh, we, we survived some, some reorganizations, some transfer, transformations of the force. Uh, we, we went through uh, two or three different philosophical changes in the way that we engage for wartime 
missions and and how our doctrine around training changed mm -hmm. so you know again moving a million a million you know we're just going to use a million as a round number i'm sure it's more than that um, but just think of what it would take to move a machine of a million people in one direction and be able to accomplish that within a three to five year time frame yeah it, it's amazing. I, I have a hard time doing it with five people in my shop, right? I mean, I it's, it's, it's a daily battle yeah. to keep people focused. And when you think back on that, it's just, you, you can't kind of say, how, how did that happen? And, and how, how did I have anything to do with that? It wasn't and it by is chance. kind of incredible. Yeah. Right. It incredible. wasn't by chance. You know, so the, the good news is that there's always that roadmap. It's, it's a, it depends on your willingness to read it, understand it, internalize it, and act on it. Um, and that, uh, you know, I, I, I I personally, to just step back, and <laughs> I think to answer your question a little bit more appropriately, mm -hmm. um, so what I didn't describe was the challenges that we specifically faced uh, for this ramp up, right? So, so I'm there, 2002, um, I got to the unit a couple months ahead of time just to do a little bit of recon and figure out what was going on with the unit. Uh, the unit had gone to Bosnia uh, several years prior. Uh, and, and it was really in this kind of rebuilding stage, and it wasn't rebuilding itself very effectively. Um, and then, you know, the next thing we know, you know, the headquarters that, that we were associated with, uh, they get alerted to go to Bosnia or Kosovo. So their, their mission now uh, stands up, and they're, they're moving towards uh, the Balkans. And, uh, you know, in the meantime, my unit starts getting tapped on the shoulder. Hey, by the way, you guys need to send a section to Afghanistan, like yeah. in June. Um, so that was easy. <laughs> June was easy. Everything after June 2002 got hard. Um, and it got hard in a lot of ways, mostly around logistics. But, you know, when I, when I mentioned the fact that we had uh, a highly specialized workforce, as it were, we also had a highly specialized uh, set of equipment. And, and what we did was absolutely amazing. Um, we, we had to, you know, and this is more of a command thing, they had to find the soldiers in, in the field artillery community that had the right scores to even participate in what we were about to do. So automatically we eliminated like, you know, 85% of the force just by the ASVAB scores that they had mm -hmm. because we couldn't accept someone into the school to get them trained. And then the school becomes now another logistical situation for us. We have to get some soldiers from the unit uh, qualified to become instructors, and we have to send them to Fort Sill, Oklahoma, to mm. get instructor qualified on the equipment in question. We have to bring them back. We have to stand up a school at the RTI and at Camp Edwards, Massachusetts, the, the Regional Training Institute. We stand up a school. We select the soldiers. We put them in the school. Our unit is now teaching the school. And these people that are going to the school are volunteering to become part of sections that will deploy. Um, and that war machine started rolling, and it rolled for six years straight. Mm -hmm. um, but we qualified everybody uh, for the most part before we left, and uh, that was in 2004. So, I mean, that was just, it was a breakneck pace. Uh, we deployed uh, eight times in six years, so between 2002 and 2008, the unit had eight deployments. I went on one of them, you know. So the one that I went on was was the longest in duration. Um, we got picked up with the 42nd Infantry Division out of New York, uh, and that was a transformation that occurred from the 26th Division to the 42nd Division. 42nd Division hadn't been hadn't been activated since the, since the Second World War. Oh wow! Um, and when they when they were activated, um, they they had taken significant casualties. Um, and there's a story about you know the patch that goes with the with the division. You know it's half the patch it used to be because they lost half of the division, I guess. Oh, wow. So, um, so anyways, uh, whatever that means, the 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 division got alerted. So we were already servicing you know the the missions in Afghanistan, and then the 42nd division, which we traced up to, that was our highest command, our division command. Um, they get alerted for. Uh, 2004 deployment and uh, when when I got the phone call from my commander you know it was first it was stand up the entire unit then it was okay we're not going to do that we're going to send you guys sections at a time uh, you know so it was it was constantly changing it was constantly moving and it didn't matter you know what year it was that something was going on um, 
and that was that was challenging. Um, it's tough, very very tough. Yeah, yeah. it was uh, it was challenging, and, yeah. and it was rewarding at the same time. Yeah, um, it, it's good to see. I mean, when it starts happening, it's amazing. It's just like I said, I could use the word amazing, but what happens when you are um, you know, when you have everybody moving in the direction, you can accomplish things that you could never do in the civilian sector. It would never happen. I mean, everybody going in the same place, great leadership, all of these things. And then weeding out the ones that just aren't going to work because that's important too. And people wonder about that. Well, you know, what if, you know, somebody's having problems? We, those people are weeded out right from the beginning. Those are the last people you want to go with. So it, in some ways, it, everybody knows where they're going. But everybody knows if they don't meet the standards, as you said before, that they're going to be going to be weeded out, and it's for the good of the unit. I know people say that for the good of the unit. The people don't feel that way sometimes. But yeah. I could talk is. to those situations specifically because we did experience that. But um, that that you know, it it is part of the game. Uh, I think it's easier for an active component to do it than the than the guard, because the guard doesn't live it every day. And I think that the yeah. legal people get a little nervous right. about taking actions that they're not sure. necessarily familiar with. Um, which made it even harder for me to do the things that I needed to do in a yeah. couple of situations, but you know, no harm, no foul. I yeah. made it. And uh, let's see, I always used to say 10% of your t time, uh, or 80% of your time is spent on 10% of your, yeah. your force. Yeah. It, it really is, because for the most, 80 to 90% of them are going in the right direction, and for the ones that you do have to spend time with, you do, for legal reasons, you know, those yeah. kinds of yeah. things. And, yeah. You know, there's all kinds of things that go on. Sometimes you have to deal with people's families, and you have to bring the whole family in, and you have to make sure that the people that are left at home are taken care of, and all of those Absolutely. things that you Absolutely. that you want to, you know. And that was kids. that was, you know, out of everything that we did. You know, like I said, when the machine starts turning, you know, when that wheel starts turning, things just start snapping into place, right? Yeah. I mean, it's gonna happen, right? There's there's no uh, value in trying to fight it, and and. Um, I think it becomes easier when you when you have internalized the situation and you know what you got to do and you go and you go do it. So I think uh, another answer to your question about how did that make me feel about you know bringing all of these people together. So I was a little concerned um, when this started happening because I'm like I don't know these guys. When I first got there, I didn't know the guys that were there. Yeah. And then you that's know, a big difference. Active right. duty, you you're with the same people every day. Right. And pretty much not in the same with the guard. We brought all yeah. of these new guys in. I'm saying to myself, "Oh my God, this is going to be interesting because I don't know right now. I don't even know who my senior leaders are going to be. I don't know who I'm going to be relying on uh, for mission and achievement." So, yeah. so it was it was interesting in that regard. I was fortunate to have a commander that was uh, among the best, in my opinion. Uh, uh, candidly, you know, uh, in the guard uh, at that time. Uh, I didn't have, and I, I'd still go on record, to, I did not have a high degree of confidence in the junior officers yeah. in the force, period. I have a son in the Army. He basically said the same thing, <laughs> okay? He was, because he'd been around the military, so he kind of said the same thing when they deployed. He's like, please, give me somebody who I got lucky. can handle it. Yeah. I got lucky. So, again, I think... You know, I don't think that there was by chance that I ended up having such a good commander. Thank God it, I did, because yeah. my mission would have been uh, impossible, I think, if it had it not been uh, for Captain Burner. Um, he really did. Uh, and trust me, um, I'm never that really gracious with my compliments to officers. So, um, <laughs> But he and I worked very well together, and no offense, of course. Oh, but, no. Well, I was uh, enlisted, too. So. Okay. Um, just want to make sure I don't go, <laughs> Not at all. go burning any Not bridges at all. here. Not at all. Believe um, me, I've heard. I've <laughs> so, so there were some folks, you know, that I met in my career that um, yeah. it would have been a much more difficult mission. Um, so, so uh, I'll give a lot of kudos also, right? So, um, I didn't always see eye to eye with the colonel that was pulling, uh, uh, pulling the the reins or the. Mm -hmm. uh, or, or designing uh, what was going on at the time. But uh, when I look back, uh, I, I really do see that he made some very, very good decisions, and that uh, is, is how we were able to succeed, because I think if we had done it differently, it would have been worse. Mm -hmm. um, and I had a great group of guys. So I, <laughs> so we went from 83 to uh, now we're going to break you up into all of these different sections. We're going to send you all over the place. And we ended up sending almost a whole unit's worth of soldiers at the same time. But we got broken up because of all of the different brigade um, combat teams that were, that were deploying with the 42nd Division. 
they all needed radars and they were all like guard uh, units that didn't have radars. So mm. now I had to chop up our unit with the with my captain and figure out who we were going to place in which <laughs> which of those units, right? So we needed to make sure we had some strong leadership because now we're taking the guys we know and we love and we're going to go put them with God only knows, you know, yeah. uh, some other units that, that yeah. may not be as squared away as some of the ones we're aware And I think that's another thing too, you know, when you're talking the civilian sector, you want your best people, I want to keep them close to me. But when you're in the military, you want to make sure that your best people are forward. You want to do what's best for the mission. You want to make sure that wherever they're going is the best way to go. Let me ask you this question and I, you know, and think about it a moment. Um, what's this the most memorable thing that you have that you can think of or, you know, something that stands out to you that you made an impression upon you, won't forget in all of your time that you've been in. I know there's probably many, okay, but, um, but uh, something in particular. Uh, so there's, there's, I think, two, um, two examples. One, one on the very uh, positive upside and, and um, you know, <laughs> It was funny, we deployed out of uh, Fort Drum, New York. So, you know, 42nd Division was in, in, in a, it's a New York unit, so it only made sense that that be our mobilization station, although uh, sometimes the Army doesn't necessarily always think that way, but um, logically that is. Um, but uh, we did end up there, we ended up there for a long time. So uh, I ended up with an order. I was looking at, I went on Title 10, uh, you know, the early uh, leaders kind of thing. Um, and, and, and I went on orders for 30 days, active duty Title 10. And then those orders converted to the next set of orders, which was, you know, when you read that deployment order and it says uh, no less than, um, it was 585 days. Yeah, you had to figure that out real quick in your head. That's more than a year. Yeah. <laughs> so, what? <laughs> what? What? So, yeah. So is, is, are you really serious about that? And, no less than, yeah. <laughs> right? So, right. Um, so it was a long period of time, and it's a long deployment. We we ended up at Fort Drum uh, on the Army's birthday in two thousand and four, uh, and actually, yeah. So we left uh, Rehoboth, Massachusetts. We convoyed up there, and we stayed there um, very very uh, late into the year two thousand four. So. Um, most memorable thing was uh, our training activities uh, because we're we're such a small unit. We went from 83 to 38. Um, I had two large radar sections that deployed with me in the headquarters element. The headquarters element, uh, the mission was to support the larger radar sections because we had a big piece of real estate we had to watch. Um, and I don't know if you're familiar with the mission or not for the for the firefinder radars, but. Uh, they tend to put us in places where people are shooting at you, you know what I mean? So, and they're not shooting well, small we arms, they're, you out there. <laughs> they're, they're shooting the big stuff at right, you. So, right. um, so we were fairly busy uh, in the locations that we deployed to. Um, but to get back to Fort Drum, we, we got there, 38 soldiers, you understand a little bit of the mission now. Uh, we, we went through uh, every one of our training events. So at one of the challenges that we had at Mob Station was you have this, we called it the horse blanket, which was here's your program of instruction before we can certify you to deploy. And basically there was, uh, God knows, there must have been 38 elements on that horse blanket of, of individual and collective tasks that needed to be accomplished to standard at Mob Station before the Mob Station commander would stamp off on the unit deployment. We were done in six weeks. We were there for almost six months. Oh. Wow. We set standards. We set the standard for every other unit that came behind us. Mm -hmm. um, I, we took a section, you know, we took a unit of people who had, uh, very few of them had ever worked together before. We trained them. We taught them to be a team and a cohesive unit. We, we took them through the training in, in, a, in a pace that no one else had, had done before us, and we achieved higher levels of rankings than, than any of our peers, active or National Guard. That's excellent. Uh, the unit got tapped again while we were, while we were downrange to go to Afghanistan mm -hmm. with another section. Um, and, and that section, um, we lost a soldier. Yeah, um, that's tough. So that's that's the worst, and 
that week there in uh, 2004, um, the brigade I was with uh, in, in Kirkuk, uh, we, we had a uh, very young female soldier who was, uh, who was killed uh, three days uh, away from uh, Sergeant Kelly's um, uh, incident. But um, that was just devastating. It was a, it was a really bad time. Yeah. So, um, you know, she was like 19. She ran the Internet Cafe on the base. She was part of the BSB. She was never supposed to be on the road. That was her job. Right. She was supposed to be on the wire the whole time she was there. The first time they put her in a seat on a convoy, uh, an IED exploded. She was in an up-armored vehicle. The, the shrapnel penetrated the vehicle, and she was killed instantly. Yeah. And I think that, you know, that's, that's the tough part is uh, no matter what your job is, you know, the, the bottom line is it's about what happens in war. And there's no way of getting around it no matter what you do. And there's no way of describing it or explaining it or yeah. understanding it. And right. um, it's hard not to um, second guess yourself. Yeah. I think, in, and that goes to what we've talked about in some of these other um, discussions that we have, is there are things that happen while you're in the military, no matter where you are, that always in your mind, and I, we talked about normal, and I said I came out of the military wondering, would I ever be normal? I mean, the things that I saw, the things that my brain, it's hard to tell your brain that this is an okay thing to happen when you see somebody get killed. So. You know, I think these are things that military people, um, this is what causes some of this difficulty. And then for some, it's even harsher, you know, because then they get, the, they get PTSD. But, um, yeah. Um, yeah. So, so that was an example of the worst. Uh, and I don't, I'm, I'm not laughing out of, uh, no, uh, I know, I listen. Of, uh, any kind of joy there. But, um, you know, it was, uh, it, 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 so the point that you just made was one that I wanted to come in here and make too. Is well, that great, good. You, 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 can't, you, you can't take uh, a normal person <laughs> um, and put them in a situation that's so abnormal and expect that after you know, 12 months of immersion in that uh, environment that you're going to come back and be okay uh, right away. And, and I think that one of the biggest issues, um, personally, I think my opinion, I have a couple of really strong opinions, um, but I think that uh, in, in some ways that maybe the Army deployments are too long, that immersion is unhealthy. Um, I think that, um, that enough isn't, isn't understood about PTSD and the triggers. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that enough is understood uh, that, we, that we could be making change, and I believe that we are. So, um, but, but you can't expect that that person coming back is going to be behaving normally. It can't be, there's no way that they could be, uh, their cognitive function has been changed forever. Right. I agree. A hundred percent. They'll never be the same. And um, so, you know, equal and offsetting uh, the challenges that you have when you come back, you, you still have a, uh, if, if you're lucky and you've had the experience that I have, uh, you know, You could pick up the phone any day. Yeah. There is a network out there. And we, it, we cling to that like it's our life and death, and in some cases it is. These were the people that were with us when we made our most difficult decisions. These are the people that stayed with us, even whether we did something right or wrong. They knew that we did our best. And these are the people that we're going to search out for every little thing that happens in our life that's that's confusing to us and and thank God thank God for all the veterans that are out there and that understand all that yeah. and that's the reason why I wore the 22 shirt today because that really it's got to get fixed yeah the sexual assault thing and the suicide has to be fixed absolutely people think oh you know it just doesn't happen anymore oh yes it does I tell and I actually um, do um, counseling with any of the high school, especially the women that want to go into the military. 
I say, come on, we're going to sit down, we're going to have a cup of coffee because we're going to talk about things and how to get around. And it's just kind of sad that I have to, you know, instruct them of how to be that. But, you know, it, it is getting, I feel it's getting better. Um, I agree that the suicide is, people recognize that what I, the difficulty I've had, especially for what I call, oops, excuse me, my, what I call citizen soldiers, okay, different from the active duty, citizen soldiers, people that have to come back, okay, I get to come back and there's other people like me, we're all wearing our uniforms the next day and so forth, I have a little bit of transition, but the citizen soldiers come back and what my son told me was, what they learned was when you go out and they ask you, do you have any problems? You say no because they'll keep you longer if you say yes. Ditto. They'll keep you there and you're not going to go to see your family. So there's a huge problem with the system because if you, if they learn that they're going to be held back for evaluation, they're going to tell you, I'm fine. And I don't think a lot of uh, folks out there realize that. Yeah. That's a problem. And there's, I, I think that there's also another perspective there too, which is, you know, I'm back. <laughs> I'm fine. Right. So that wasn't so good that isn't what's going yeah. on anymore. Yeah, things are going to get better. So, yeah, it, it, and I think it takes uh, several months for it to hit rock bottom, right? Yes. I think that that's, you know, 90, and I, you know, I know that the system is designed to try to prevent um, uh, that because the units are programmed to come back on, you know, at least drilling status within, you know, 60, 90 days or whatnot. Right. So I know that's factored in there, but you, you touch on a huge point, which is, everybody's cast to the wind again. Now you're right. you're back home and you have to try to figure these things out for yourself. Um, and it's not always easy to navigate. Um, yeah, I, that's something that I, I saw was a real difficulty in having to deal with, you know, or, um, and I worked in the medical career field to see a lot of the reserves and the guard, you know, going through that. So, yeah. um, and, and I think you've already answered this question in, in your dialogue here just by what you said, but what's the, the final thoughts, because we have to wrap it up, what are your final thoughts about what you, if you could tell somebody the most impression that you want to leave with somebody about being in the military, like that somebody that maybe wouldn't understand, what would you like to say to them? Um, I, I believe that um, when you decide that that is something that you want to do um, that uh, the the ability to use the military experience uh, to your uh, advantage uh, in your career whether it be civilian or military uh, there, there's nothing like it anywhere else um, there really isn't and and quite frankly I think like the uh, the Israelis have it figured out you know it's like you get to be a certain age, you get to serve the country. Yeah. When you get done with your service, now you understand what it means to be a citizen. Yeah, I agree with that. And I think that's a good point to end this with. You know, we, we've had these discussions and you hear, well, everybody, they're saying how bad it is and how you come back and you can't fit in. And yet the last thing you said was, what an experience it is. And I always say, no regrets. I've never had any regrets. So I think people need to understand that is that despite everything that goes on, we understand it, we understand the difficulties, but it's an experience that you'll, not many will have. And I think for most part, 90% of us say it's a good experience. And uh, so we'll thank you so much for being here, exposing yourself. I know it's difficult and um, I think it's important. So I wanna thank, thank you. you very much for your courage to come here and talk about that. Really, thank you. Thank you.